Um, I think I've said this now twice, but I'm obviously not Neil Brown. I won't try any humour. Um, but uh, what I will do is take this opportunity to talk to you all briefly about some of the work the Society has been doing over the last 12 months in addition to running this conference and the other sort of programming that you would be accustomed to over the last 30 years. One of the benefits of having a secretariat that is staffed by employees, not volunteers, is that we can do more with our efforts. And um, when I came on in, um, into this role about three years ago, one of the things that we discussed as a board was um, that we might start to use the society's voice to contribute more actively to the public discourse around important issues surrounding the constitution. Uh, the society's motto is to uphold the Australian constitution. And although I'm very um, cognizant of the fact that you know, we are a debating society in the mould of the Federalist Society, we don't adopt institutional positions and we don't enforce a particular worldview or policy position on any of our members. We do exist to protect and defend the constitution and that's something which um, is relatively unique to this group um, because the constitution is something that it's very easy to take for granted, particularly when times are good. There's obviously been a lot of focus on the constitution in the last 12 months or so because of the referendum, but, but otherwise it's one of those things that Australians take for granted. It's delivered so much prosperity to us over the last uh, however many odd years, 130 odd years, that most people my age have never had to think about the Constitution. It's never been under threat. Uh, but certainly we know that in other countries uh, where they don't have a Constitution like ours, um, they don't have that luxury. So um, the research that we've done primarily has been into that area. The voice has been, and I, I might see if this is working. Yes, very good. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the research we've done in the last 12 months has been around the referendum. So we've this year been able to double our research output in terms of submissions to public inquiries. The first of which was um, to one of the precursor inquiries prior to the um, announcement of the referendum. Uh, and really this was just us advocating for the retention of the uh, traditional way of doing things, the retention of the yes and no pamphlet, because obviously there was some discussion uh, from the government that they might abolish that yes and no pamphlet uh, in favour of public education in support of the uh, referendum proposal. And also um, uh, our advocacy was around the retention of section 128 as it currently stands. So that was the first. Oops, I've gone too far there, I think. Uh, yes, uh, the, um, the second was in relation to the administration of the referendum. And again, this related to the idea that uh, we need to have a fair and robust debate, that Australians are benefited by having a real contest of ideas rather than by being given only one side of the argument. It's what Louise was talking about before. It's what we've tried to do with this conference. I, I regret many of you would have um, been aware that um, Professor Gabrielle Appleby had been invited and had accepted the invitation to speak at this conference. She has been obviously um, quite involved in um, the generation of the proposal and we were looking forward to hearing from her. She, for reasons I won't go into, um, was unable to be with us, withdrew. Um, but, you know, it was very important to us that we have a genuine contest of ideas. And I noticed that in the, the last few weeks it seems that um, that's happening less and less. I know my colleague Tom Switzer um, had a very successful debate with the yes and no speakers earlier in the year in Sydney and had tried to do the same thing recently uh, in the smaller states and has, like I, uh, had, had, um, has had real difficulty in finding um, speakers on the yes side who are willing to participate in those debates. I think that's to the detriment of the yes campaign as well as to the detriment of the nation uh, because a public discourse that is well informed and robust Will always generate a better outcome. So that's been important to us as well. And then obviously there was the uh, submission that we made to the Select Committee Inquiry into the Voice. Um, there were many excellent submissions 
um, of which ours was not one, um, but there were many. Uh, and we heard from uh, Nick Aroni this morning, who made an excellent submission, and uh, the president of the society made a fantastic submission too. And, um, and really, all we sought to do in that submission, acknowledging that the society doesn't have a position on the voice, um, and that there are a range of views, was to point out some of the concerns that we had identified um, about the proposal. The, that work then was followed on by uh, a symposium that we held in Brisbane in May, which a number of you attended. Uh, and, and we felt the need to do that because uh, we'd, had, we'd set the date for August for this conference, but we felt that the conversation needed to be had earlier and in a, an informed way. So we, we did that in Brisbane. We had a, a number of excellent speakers, Gary Johns, Amanda Stoker, Warren Mundine, and, um, and Ian Callanan as well. And what we have now done is produced this booklet, and you'll find copies of these on your tables now, but also don't uh, fret, we've got many more copies at the registration desk, and everyone today who wants one of these will be able to take one home with them. And if you want more copies to send to your neighbours, your colleagues, your friends and family, then you only need to get in touch with us. The reason that we've done this uh, is so that there is a document which is accessible that allows people to have a more informed view about some of the issues around the proposal. It really is a follow-up to this little booklet that the Society produced in the lead-up to the 1999 referendum, uh, which features some of the words of the late Sir Harry Gibbs. Um, and Ian Callanan's contribution to this booklet is on a par, I think I can say fairly safely, with Sir Harry's contribution to that discussion in the lead up to the 1999 referendum. So I encourage you to, to grab a copy of that. The only reason that was possible is because of the support of our, our members and our supporters, particularly our 30th Anniversary Society members. Um, I was going to give these remarks at afternoon tea, an afternoon tea that's sponsored by our 30th Anniversary Society. I won't um, thank the members of the 30th Anniversary Society by name now, but I do want to acknowledge and both those that are in the room and also those who can't be with us right now for their support of the society, because it is that support, along with all of your support, that's made this increased research output possible. Uh, finally, on the voice, I noticed that the Prime Minister um, had, had said that he'd only read the one-page Uluru Statement from the heart and hadn't read any of the appendices that um, have now come into the public view thanks to the uh, fantastic journalistic work of Peter Credlin. Um, I know that reading a 26-page document can be a tall order for some people, so the Society has also produced, and you'll find copies of these on your table too, a very handy summary. We, we tried to get to one page, but really there's so much in there that we've gone for two pages, double-sided, but we hope that the Prime Minister has the time to read these two pages. I, I just wanted to highlight some of the comments that stood out to me from uh, this document. There are uh, over 100 pages um, and it's all come out through Freedom of Information. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the things that were said as part of the process for generating the Uluru Statement. So these were said at various regional dialogues that were held as part of um, the uh, journey to the voice, various referendum councils, largely in 2017 under um, the previous government, but in any event. Some things that stood out to me, and you'll see this all in the document. Um, I'm, I think um, it's fair to say, a good and certainly a proud example of multiculturalism in Australia. My, my father's side of the family is Italian, came after the Second World War. My mother's side of the family is Chinese. So I'm a proud believer in multiculturalism. Well, at the Dubbo Dialogue, it was said, we are not part of multiculturalism. We are First Nations. It was also said that as a result of that, they, that Indigenous people should have a body with a power of veto over legislation in Australia. At the dialogue in Adelaide, I believe it was, they um, discussed having designated seats in Parliament. Uh, they've also, at the same dialogue in Adelaide, talked about uh, having a percentage of GDP apportioned on the basis of, of race. In Brisbane, there was discussion of this concept of sovereign debt, paying back 
debts owed due to dispossession and colonialism as a form of reparation, and that is a common theme throughout the dialogues, reparation, percentage of taxes, percentage of GDP. These are all things that the Prime Minister has not been willing to address, but are part of the roadmap outlined in this document. So I think it is important that people are aware of, of that. Um, a particularly telling comment about paying the rent, that multinational corporations should give 1%, 2%, 5%, or even an open checkbook. These are the things that the Prime Minister doesn't want to talk about, but it's, it's not enough to, to simply say, well, you know, these are just some views that have been expressed. The, the research that the society has done, and we looked at, and, um, and Nick Aroni sort of stole a bit of my thunder, I suppose, today, because we've also looked at Canada. And a paper that will be soon published as part of this year's volume um, went into the situation in Canada, some of the things that Nick mentioned as well, but also um, something that, that Professor Oney didn't mention that I found remarkable, which was that when the Canadians amended their constitution to introduce, I have to, I believe it's section 35 of their constitution, yes, 35, um, they left undefined the phrase uh, recognised and affirmed. And the idea was that we can't agree now on what this should mean, so we won't define it now. We'll leave it to the premiers to all meet and they'll define the term and that will be fine. Is it starting to sound a bit familiar about, you know, we'll do it after the referendum, we'll figure it out after the referendum what these things mean? Anyway, the, the premiers met, they met several times actually, they couldn't agree on a definition. So it went undefined. And eventually the courts stepped in, as you can imagine, and the courts, and I think the case here was in the Crown and Sparrow, uh, if my notes are correct. Um, the courts gave an expansive interpretation to this undefined term, which gave rise to this honour of the Crown that Professor Roney was talking about. So I won't retread the ground that he's already covered. But that was where it came from. It was a decision during a referendum process not to define something because it was too difficult to define. We'll all do it, we'll do it later. Trust us, we'll, we'll get it right through the legislative process, the parliamentary process. And that was good in theory, but in practice didn't happen. I think that's a compelling warning about the suggestion that Australians should give a blank check to parliament to legislate, to define the power, composition, etc., of the voice. I do think that that is a, is a, is a stark warning. So that's another paper that the society has developed that will soon be published. And um, Ben, uh, in his question to Louise before, stole a little bit more of my thunder because we've also um, produced a paper uh, looking at the history, not only of ATSIC, but of other uh, Indigenous representative and, and advisory bodies. And again, I won't go into too much detail about that, but I did want to highlight one uh, statistic that I found to be quite interesting uh, in our research. And that was that in elections, for ATSIC, which was meant to be a representative body, and that's the whole argument for the voice. The, the, the argument for the voice, as I understand it, really boils down to this. It's that all of the problems in Indigenous policy can be solved and will be solved if we just listen to Indigenous people. If we just let them have a say and we just listen to them, all the problems will be solved. That's essentially the argument. Well, you know, ATSIC never crossed the threshold of 30% participation in its elections. And, and Warren Mundine at our symposium in Brisbane you know, was, was telling me about, some, you know, in some elections, you could have 30 people vote for you and you could be elected. You could just have your friends and family vote for you and you'd be elected. We, we, we sort of, in Victoria, have, have begun to almost see this with the First Nations People's Assembly, with Lydia Thorpe and her family trying to wrest control of that body um, with limited success in the most recent elections. But, but it, I think that's remarkable. If you talk about representing Indigenous people to have such a low participation rate, never even reaching 30% in the most um, successful 
election there. Um, then it does, to me, reinforce something that Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine have been saying for months now, that this isn't going to give a voice to the people that need it most, the people in the remote communities who are not represented well in our current system, yes, perhaps, but are not going to be represented by another body in Canberra. And that's what you know, they're saying, uh, they're hearing on the ground. So that's, that's the final piece of, of original research we've done on The Voice. Um, the Voice hasn't been the only issue that we've looked at this year, and I, I'm coming to the end of my time, I, I think, but um, I'll touch on it briefly. The inquiry into the 2022 federal election, you might think, why is the Samuel Griffith Society putting in a submission about an election? Something that hasn't been reported on yet by the committee and hasn't received very much media attention at all is that at the bottom of the list of terms of reference for this inquiry, ostensibly into the election that we just had last year, was a, were a series of uh, points about what could be quite significant reform to our electoral system that um, does raise some challenges around the Constitution. The idea that we should have proportional representation of the states and territories, irrespective of the provisions of the Constitution, that the guarantee of a minimum number of seats and of equal Senate representation for small states like Tasmania is under threat by this government. So the society put in a submission about why those provisions exist, why Tasmania or Western Australia or South Australia or even Queensland, why they deserve those guarantees, why they were put in. We went back to the convention debates and we pulled out quotes from Premier of Tasmania, Premier of Western Australia, you know, and other delegates from those small states. Because we thought it was important that in amongst all of the discussion about the election, the, the, this didn't sneak through. This idea that we should give the ACT equal representation to Tasmania because of, you know, because of the size of the Tasmanian population. Uh, that was very important to us as well. So um, that submission is also available um, online and you can find that um, there as well. The final one, was the uh, Integrity Commission, the NACCC. I won't say too much about this. Chris Merritt from the Rule of Law Institute has written an immense amount of very informative work there and his submission um, to this same inquiry. We were only given, I think, about seven days, Chris, to do this. It was just outrageous. But Chris's submission is excellent. We put a submission in too, um, fairly limited. Again, noting the society doesn't take institutional positions beyond defending the constitution, the rule of law, Etc. So um, I don't know whether we've got time for questions now. Um, I suspect we don't. No, I think we'll go to, it's 3.32 now, so we'll go to afternoon tea. And if any of you do want to discuss any of this, um, you can certainly feel free to come and find me. Thanks very much for your attention.